Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's a privilege to be back preaching again here, and um, we're going to return. We're just going to be dealing again with Genesis chapter three, and we're going to be looking at the second message of this. The first message we were looking at the fall of man and the sequence of events that led to the fall of man, which was dealing with verses one to seven. Now I want to look at verses seven to nine and. I guess it'll be kind of like a mini-series. There won't be many sermons on this, but I pray, Lord willing, to be able to do one more after this, just on Genesis chapter 3. We're just going to read um, from Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 19 for context, but before I do, we'll just bow, we'll bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your blessings. This day that we could be here, what a privilege it is to hear your precious and holy word. Lord, I am, I am weak, and Lord, I, have, I do not have the words to express your majesty. But Lord, enable me this night. Use me for thy glory. May people see you through your word this night. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's read from Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 1 onwards, just for the context. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gave, gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. We'll, <clears throat> we'll deal up to verse 19 today. Um, Adam, being the federal head of all mankind, we know this from... Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 14 and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 
is the federal head of all mankind. In verses 1 to 7, we see that Adam chooses willfully and consciously to disregard the one stipulation in, that God gives Adam in the garden. To not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve both chose the way of death. But it is Adam's sin that condemned the whole human race. He doubted, then denied, and, and chose the way of death. They thought that God was holding something back from them. They listened to the whispers and the, list and the counsel of the serpent when he said, For God doth know that in a day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Who wouldn't want that? Ye shall be as gods. God knows that as soon as you partake of this, you'll become like God. The tree of life pointed to life. Again, like the illustration I gave the last time, these things in and of themselves did not give life, but they pointed towards the one who gave life. Uh, Augustine and also John Calvin agreed that this was a type of Christ in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil brought forth death. When God was forbidding them from eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't not just simply about fruit. We're talking about God was saying with these symbols, depend on me, rely upon me, for I'm the source of all the good that you enjoy. Have the liberty, subdue all these things according to Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28, and subdue it and enjoy all the fruits of of this garden. But I ask you to do one thing. Do not eat of this one tree. As we know from the last time, man fell. And now was dead in two ways. I don't even when we meet them in verse 7. Dead judicially to condemnation and dead spiritually. At this point they are walking corpses. Unable to, unable to even know their state of depravity. Almost another illustration that the scriptures use to describe after the fall, after the fall is actually the title for this message, that we're spiritual lepers. If we want to see and understand the very cause of all the sorrows, all the woes of our present condition and our present world. God created everything good. Adam, as federal head, brought the, the just curse of God upon the earth and brought original sin into all those who were born of Adam. John Calvin states on original sin, Original sin does not reside in one part of the body only, but holds its dominion over the whole man, and so occupies every part of the soul that none remains in its integrity. And by the reaction and by the behavior of Adam and Eve, we will see this, that it corrupts all of them and their activities. John Trapp, the Puritan, stated that the first man, referring to Adam, defiled the nature, and ever since, the nature defiles the man. As poison put into a cup of wine disperses itself and makes itself deadly, so original sin polluteth and poisoneth our whole man. The outline for today's message is this. We're going to first just look at verses 1 to 6 briefly in regards to the crime, secondly, the covering, third, the cowardice, fourth, the culpability, fifth, the cursing, and sixth, the consequences. Number one, the crime. Because we have to understand the crime before we go forward and look at the judgment of God and see why things proceeded as they did. The severity of Adam's crime 
can be only seen by looking at the counsel of the one he was following. Do we listen? And this is very practical in our own lives. Are we listening to the counsel of the devil or are we listening to the counsel of God? One will say, you can be like God. Make your own choices. Make your own judgments. Trust in your own understanding. Don't lean upon God. The other one will say, your own understanding is faulty. Are you, what did they do? They listened to the counsel of the devil, who was using the serpent, the one who man was instructed to subdue. The devil who said, who said in Isaiah 14, verses 13 to 14, for thou, Lucifer, hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, ho- the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And that is, I will be like the Most High. That is what they listened to. When he repeated, ye should be like gods, knowing good and evil. You, yourself, your experiential knowledge can decide what is good and evil. And again, as we looked, there was in James chapter 3, near the end of James chapter 3, the two types of wisdom, one being from above and the other being sensual and of this earth. But God's counsel was this, one simple stipulation. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it thou shalt surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. At that point, man said, I do not depend upon God. And he chose death. Adam and Eve both chose to listen to the counsel of the author of lies. They were not only... See, God said to them, Here is the result if you disobey. But man doubted that. Adam and Eve, they doubted that. They, well, it can't possibly be that rigorous, can it? They were not only dead when we meet them in verse, in, in verse 7, but now they were spiritual children of the devil because they were now his captives. John chapter 8 verse 44 when Jesus is dealing with a number of disciples following him saying we are of Abraham he says no you are of your your father the devil and the loss of your father you will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. They were taking the counsel of the father of lies. Paul Washer, when talking and told depravity, says, and just to understand where they are at this point, before this, they had not the sin itch, and now they were totally depraved. Paul Washer states that total depravity does not mean that the image of God was totally lost in the fall. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 7, and James 3, 9 are just some of the verses that we can refer to. It's not totally lost. We're still God's image bearers, but it's been so changed that we're no longer exactly in His image. Total depravity does mean, he goes on to say, that the image of God in man has been seriously defaced or disfigured, and that the moral corruption has polluted the entire person. Body, reason, emotions, and will. The state of death for which man is now in, we continue, that this is why you can call it after the fall, because things are now completely different. And continues today, apart from Christ, unless we're regenerated, this is our condition. John Trapp said, Sure it is, we can say no more for sinning, than the, we can stop no more from sinning, than the heart can from panting. Imagine this, Can you stop your heart from beating? Can you stop from breathing? This is how natural sinning is to us. Sure it is, as he says again, we can stay no more from sinning than the heart can from panting and the pulse from beating. 
the first man defiled the nature. And ever since, the nature defiles the man. As poison put into a cup of wine disperses itself and makes it deadly, so original sin polluteth and poisoneth our whole man. Point two, the covering. Verse seven. Okay, having done this, what was the response of our first parents? Did they run to God in their error and transgression? What was the first response? Even before they heard the word of God come forth, what did they do? The first response was this. And their eyes, verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew they were naked. The shame, what the devil told them came true, but not in the way they were expecting. Their eyes were opened to their shame. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Rather than running to God, they sought their own efforts to cover their own sin. <laughs> this day, Christian, do, what, what do you do when you sin? Do you follow the counsel of God running to the throne of grace? Or do you follow your first parents? Do you try to attempt do you try to sew your own fig leaves together to attempt to hide your shame from God? Our parents, while awakened to the shame of what they've done, now attempted to cover up the crime. They thought, foolishly, that they could hide it from God. And how many people think from running from God, from hiding from God, hiding what they've done from God, that they can actually escape the judgment of God. Proverbs 28 verse 13. Proverbs 28 verse 13. He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Job refers to what Adam did when he stated in Job 31, verse 33, If I covered my transgressions as Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Imagine this, right? Not only does he break the one stipulation, he also then goes on to add sin to sin. He hides it. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1 says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, and not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. It is not just in our unconverted state we sin, we will do nothing but sin. Even in the attempt to correct the error, we will also add more sin to it and make our condition worse. Where do we see this? Human religion. Rituals of the, the Roman Catholic Church, rituals of any religion are attempts to hide God and cover with our own works. It simply will not do. Point number three, the cowardice. Not only are they trying to cover up their crime, they have now become cowards. They think they can run from God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. In the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Amongst the trees of the garden. They, the first attempt failed. And then once they heard the word of God it pricked their conscience. And they realized it wasn't enough. Their first response to the word of God when they heard the voice of the word of God was to run. How often when, for example, when some of us are street preaching uh, on Grafton Street on a Thursday, you will often see people walk faster. Actually pick up pace as they walk past. What a perfect illustration. What we see from our first parents is what the unconverted man will do. He will cover his sin, and when the Word of God confronts him, he'll run. He'll run. He'll try to hide from it. The problem is, there's nowhere to hide from the judgment of God. <coughs> Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, 
The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. There is the wicked and those who have been infected by, we've all, those who been born in iniquity, born in sin, we're cowards. We will not face up to responsibilities. We will not face up to, I have done this wrong. <clears throat> I'm come to, for mercy. We'll run from our responsibilities. They have become cowards with their defiled natures and ran from the presence of God. And again, part of the application of this is, what is your response to sin? Do you run from it? Or do you run to God? Do you, when you look at a passage of Scripture and say, well, I'm sinning from this. No, not, not studying this now. Ever done that? I know I have at times. You cannot run from that. God, when you hear the voice of God convicting you over things, how do you react to it? It says a lot about a person, how he will react to God chastising him. You're doing this wrong. You need to hear the counsel of God. Our first parents were pierced to the heart by the word of God. As, the, as do all unconverted men when they hear it. But they love darkness. And they will run to the darkness and confusion. And they will run and fight against and hold down the truth and unrighteousness. As Romans 1.18 tells us. With all their might. It is not just that men cannot understand these things. They're confused by these things because they don't have full understanding. But it's not that they do not have the mental capacity. It is morally they hate the truth. That is a tough saying. But from all we see from the word of God. And from all we see from the reactions to the word of God. There's no indication that any of that is not true. John Calvin states on this that there is none of us who does not smile at their folly. They're running from the work, they're running from God. He's, they're hiding. Since certainly it was ridiculous to place such a covering before the eyes of God. In the meanwhile, we are all infected with the same disease. For indeed we tremble and are covered with shame at the first uh, compunctions of conscience. Conscience. But self-indulgence soon steals in and induces us to resort to vain trifles. As if it were an easy thing to delude God. And here's the thing. Do you really think you're deluding God? That's what we think we're doing. The times when we run from the truth is when we think we can delude God. John Trapp states that our first parents here in hiding themselves did but as the fish, imagine this now, as the fish which swimmeth the length of the line with a hook in his mouth, as one well observeth. They can't get away. There is no escaping God. The psalmist writes, if I make my bed in hell, he's there also. We think we can escape from God. We cannot. John Trapp states that the simple, or the ignorant, may hide God from themselves and then think they have hid themselves from God. Do you think you can delude God? And if you, if you have the sense, run to Him. Run to Him. If you, are uncomfort if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, run to Him. Flee from the city of destruction. Because you cannot delude God and run to Him and confess your sin if you are a believer. Whatever idols you have, shed them. In verse 9 onwards it states, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. It hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God knew where they were. This is not a question of God is confused where they are. 
imagine, if you will, a judge standing and asking criminals to explain their actions. Adam, where are you? To give an answer for themselves. As a judge who asks for the defense before he delivers the verdict. Rather than pleading for mercy, as they ought to have done, they proceed to add sin unto sin. Point four, the culpability or the blame. The culpability. Reading from... Read 11 and... Read from verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. What's the first thing you hear? When, when God looks for what, have you, what, what hast thou done? Why have you done this thing? What's their response? We're so sorry. Why have we done this? No. Adam's response was this. The woman. It's the woman's fault. Oh, not, not even that. No, it's even worse than this. Whom thou gavest to be with me. He's not only just blaming the woman, he's blaming God. You, you gave her to me. Our shame often reveals us. We often... Our body language often changes. Their eyes were open to what they had done. Often, to various degrees, people can tell if we're acting guilty. If we've done something wrong or we're acting a bit shifty. But God knows straight away. We, they were completely revealing their guilty consciences. God asks him to give an answer. Does he turn to God begging for forgiveness, even though he is quite aware of the commandment? No. He blames God. How often do we do the same? The woman who thou gavest to be with me. So he placed the blame on God and on the woman. And again, how do we respond when the word of God convicts us? Do we say, well, if only my circumstances were a little bit different. If only I had some more money. You know, if only I had a different job. If only I had, if I lived in that country, I, I'd be a much better Christian and I'd serve the Lord in a better way. So I've got to change my circumstances. You know, God's sovereign over your circumstances. No one can do that law. That's not possible to obey that. Well, I'm not responsible for that. And we all have these kind of reasoning faculties in our minds brethren but we must repent of them straight away we must God has placed you in the job you're in but God has given you the circumstances God has put you in the family you're in I know I come from a family of unbelievers and sometimes I think it's so hard I, feel, I start feeling sorry for myself at times but the thing about it is God has placed you in there for his glory are we, when we fall and stumble, are we placing the blame where it belongs at our own hearts? Or do we attempt to blame others for what we ourselves have done? Oh, the foolishness of thinking such things. Because God is sovereign and to blame for our lack is to blame God for our sin. And do exactly what our first parents did. I have heard so many charismatic sermons over the years and from fundamentalist circles as well which almost make men sound like the victims of the devil and not willing criminals who willingly listen to his counsel and love it. It's a stench before God. The, the question here is what do you wrap yourself in? What do you clothe yourself in? Do you wrap yourself in Christ or the excuses of your first parents. If you wrap yourself in excuses, you are not trusting in God. The, all they reverted to was excuses. It's not me, it's her. And you'll see this in family situations all the time. 
It's not me, it's not my fault, it's my kids. It's not me, it's my job. If only, brethren, your sin is your own. And you must go to the grace of God and not blame the God who's sovereign for the things, the blessed things. Give glory to God for the things He has given you. The blame resides nowhere else. Not even transferring it to the devil as if the devil is manipulating you and not giving, it, and giving you something you don't even want. The reason why it's enticing and you love it is because you want the same thing the devil wants at times. Your old nature, that struggle between the old nature and the inner man. The inner man which never sins and then the old nature which cannot but sin. Your greatest enemy is not the devil or the unsaved world, but your own heart. Don't spread the blame where the blame resides right here. Steve Lawson stated that no one can be spiritually rich until they are declared bankruptcy before God. They did not declare bankruptcy here. Not my fault, it's hers. And as long as you are like that, if you are unconverted, if you do not know Christ, you are without hope. <coughs> John Trapp stated that sin and shifting came into the world together. Never yet any came to hell, but had some pretense for coming thither. It is a very coarse wool that will take no dye. Sin and Satan are alike in this. They cannot abide to appear in their own color. Men wrap themselves in excuses as they do their hands to defend themselves from pricks. Point number five, the cursing. Verses 14 to 17. Verses 14 to 17. I'll read them again. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly thou shalt go. And thus thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Sin brought in the just judgment of God. Now we have to see, this is the very root of why there is so much suffering in the world. Now, the serpent is judged in order to place the severity of this, cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. God began a war, a conflict. He put enmity between two seeds that are still at war with each other today. This is why we have suffering in the world. Why do we have suffering? Because sin entered in. This is why everything is so hard. The curse did not bring in work. Um, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The man was already a steward and his job was, his, his responsibility was to subdue all in the garden to the glory of God. But, now, it takes on a different characteristic. Now, everything becomes difficult. And before we think we would have done any differently, we have not examined our own hearts. Because so far, every one of us are guilty of what Adam and Eve have done. Every one of us. J.C. Royal stated that sin and departure from God are the true reasons why people are everywhere laboring and heavy laden. Sin is the universal disease which infects the whole earth. Sin brought in thorns and thistles at the beginning and obliged man to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. 
Sin is the reason why the whole creation groans and travails in pain, and the foundations of the earth are out of course. Romans 8.22, Psalm 82.5 Sin is the cause of all the burdens which now press down mankind. Most people know it not, and weary themselves in vain to explain the state of things around them. But sin is the great root and foundation of all sin, whatever proud man may think. How much people ought to hate sin. This is why we ought to hate sin. But often, man foolishly, well not often, man foolishly in his own converted state will hate God. And blame God in the same way his first parents did. This is why the whole creation groans and travails in pain. And the foundations of the earth are out of course. Everything. This is the severity of sin. This is what it means to depart from God and to follow the counsel of the author of lies. The one who said, I will be like the Most High. You will be as gods if you work hard enough and involve and... Every false religion in the world has a version of this. By your own efforts, you can pull up your bootstrap. The biggest challenge, brethren, we face in the battle within the Reformed community is keeping the idea and the doctrine of free will out. Because of its ramifications, it is to exalt man. This is why it comes in in the first place. Our flesh will naturally veer towards free will, will worship, and the things that satisfy us, not the things of God. This is the greatest battle we face. Why? Because it is a commonality which is between all other religions. It is the exaltation of man. When we are slothful in this, and slothful in our understanding of the Word of God, and how we expose it, and how we declare it, this is why the weeds and the thorns and the thistles come in and the slothfulness arises and what happens? Doctrines which exalt men are brought up. A war began, verse 15. I won't be looking at a lot of verse 15, Lord willing, the next time um, on the third message on Genesis chapter 3. But we'll just look at and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Two seeds. Briefly, the seed of the woman, the seed of Christ. And the seed of the serpent, all those who are the children of the devil. But we'll look in that more the next time. A war began. All those who do not know Christ and are not in Christ are enemies of the gospel, we are told. Childbirth is now painful and dangerous because of this sin. The ground is cursed so that man no longer has abundance. In the Garden of Eden, he was given abundance. And how does man respond? It's not enough. It's not enough. Have you ever prayed for something? And then God answers your prayer. And then five minutes later, you find something else that's not quite to your liking. In our state, we, it's never enough. But brethren, Christ, if we are to be used of God, we ha Christ has to be enough for us. Not only enough for us, more than enough. Because of in Him are hid all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. In Him. He's not saying, well, go to another source. Go to the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because there you can discover all the things that are not in the Word of God. But the Scriptures plainly declare, in Him. You see, we have to measure all things in this world by this standard, because in, in him is Colossians two, chapter th or Colossians chapter two, verse three states, in him in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all, not some, not a little, all the treasures. Because, brethren, even I believe the doctrine of sola scriptura is even in Genesis chapter three. Depend upon the tree of life. The Word of God. This is why you have, when up for the first five, six centuries, you had the, uh, the church that was in Rome. 
actually want, seeming to be a, a true church. But then, in the 7th century, it became the Church of the Antichrist. As it declared the Pope in Rome to be the universal bishop. But what led to that? The departure from the dependence upon God's word and the bringing in of experiential knowledge to be on the same par. Now tradition and scripture on the same level. Catholic author Walker Percy asked this question. And this is the question that vexes so many philosophers in the world because they can't understand it as Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 17 states man by his own knowledge cannot know God and what we mean by that knowledge is the knowledge experiential knowledge that gets from nature you cannot know God from that way he says why does man feel so sad in the very age when more than in any other age he has succeeded in satisfying his needs and making of the world to his own use in a lot of ways, in some ways, man loves his sin, but he's also perpetually miserable and can never have enough. Point number six. The consequences. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 states, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now the ground of the land will bring forth weeds such as thorns and thistles. Verse 18 and 19 states, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou hast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt thou return. There's different illustrations throughout the Bible of thorns and thistles. Very practically from a agricultural point of view, you could say they are a hindrance. Numbers 33 verse 55, Joshua 23 verse 13. But they're also where fire, if it, takes, if it catches, tends to gather. Objects of wrath. We turn to Proverbs 24 verse 30. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Verse 31. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Whenever... Whenever slothfulness enters into the Christian walk, whenever laziness becomes the characteristic practice of the church, thorns and thistles come as readily as they do in a field that is not kept. What we must labor towards is keeping the thorns and the thistles that will grow over the field of a ministry, of a home, and especially the nation, they must be kept back. These thorns, another illustration, uh, Mark uh, chapter 4 verse 7. Mark chapter 4 verse 7, it states, when it Describing four in the parable Jesus gives, gives of four different types of seeds. Chapter 7, and some fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Goes on to explain it a little bit more in more detail in verses 18 and 19. And these are which sown among thorns, which as heard, as hear the word, the cares of the world. What are the thorns that can enter into the church? The cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in and choke the word and it become unfruitful. How many, how easy is it, brethren, in the Christian life to, depend, to worry about the cares of this world and to not trust in God? To worry sinfully and not trust in God? To look to the deceitfulness of riches. And often it can be quite subtle. In my 
short time as a Christian over the last five years, I have seen what happens when churches, when pushed to the wire, often are dependent for self-preservation, will alter their methods for evangelism. It ceases to become, after a while, about souls coming to Christ. It becomes about numbers in the door. And it is wonderful, <coughs> brethren, to have lots of people in the door. And that is not what we're saying here. But we must follow God-ordained methods, preaching of the Word of God, not gimmicks, not things of this world which choke the world, Word and make it unfruitful. Because God will not bless that. Thorns and thistles, figuratively. Now, what I mean by figuratively, I do not mean that the account in Genesis is not literal. But many of these things, just like the temple in Jerusalem or the tabernacle, they were physical, literal things, but they pointed towards other things also. They were figures of the true. The thorns and the thistles were there, figuratively pointed towards sin and the results of sin. Illustrations, if you will. Just as our own works produce sin, so the earth <coughs> is cursed and reflects that. Do, are we slothful in our Christian work? Are we allowing the thorns and the thistles, which will come in naturally, brethren? These are not things you have to work towards. Satan does not have to be invited through the front door. Again, I say this again. Satan is not your greatest enemy, your own heart is. And the slothfulness is what we're naturally inclined towards. Or to do other things that are not prescribed in the Word of God. There's different ways of being slothful and careless. We can often, sin is not just simply coming short. It can also be going to the left of the mark, going to the right of the mark, or even going beyond what you're supposed to do. When the great, speaking about going beyond the matter, one of the greatest dangers the church ever faces, I believe, is this, is going beyond what it's supposed to do. Yeah. The family has its jurisdiction, the church has its jurisdiction, and the state has its own jurisdiction. I pray in our day, we will understand each of those three, that we will labor towards that, because Rather than sometimes we run from the true responsibilities of the church or the family and run toward and give it to other people. It's much easier to take responsibilities that haven't been given to you as you choose. Husbands, wives, children, pastors, etc. and so on. Your responsibility is what is designated in the word of God. You do not fall short of that. And by the grace of God, he makes up what? We will fall short of that. But that is our responsibility. We do not make excuses why we do not do these things. And then jump to other places. If you are a father, your responsibility is to your wife. And to teach your wife the word of God. And also to your children if you are so blessed to have them. What are your responsibilities? There are so many things, brethren. There, And I hear it from so many people of the th you can see the thorns and thistles bringing into their field that it is like this I know my Bible well enough don't tell me about that surely it cannot say that in the word of God I know my Bible that's fine no 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 but we need to worry about pre-tribulation rapture things like this this is what's Important now. Things we're not told to do in the Word of God because we like to do them. Because why when we do them, we feel a little bit proud, don't we? Conclusion. Sin has consequences. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There are consequences even in the Christian life. You're saved if you're saved here today, wonderful praise the Lord. May God get all the glory. But there are things you will sow in your Christian life that will go on and have reverberations for generations. There's no doubt about it. There's blessings and cursings that are spoken of for the family, for the church, 
It speaks of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 about the, threaten, the threatening to remove the candlestick. And I remember for a very long time thinking, well, the building will be removed or something like that. It won't be there anymore. But often it won't be that. Often it will be the greatest judgment upon any church. <coughs> the people will still gather, the building will still be there, but no one will be saved. The light will go out. And what you will have is a church that specializes in soup kitchens. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But does not know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Has left their first love. And has not repented. There are judgments for the family. And there are judgments for the state. May we not run from them. May we not hide from them. What is your... When you're faced, all of us make mistakes but how do we respond to them is the difference are you running from your responsibilities like your first parents see this this chapter one of the reasons it is one of the most tragic chapters in the bible obviously because here's where rebellion and sin came in but i believe it is one of the most practical chapters in the bible sin is consequence are you running from your responsibilities like our first parents are you a coward who runs away from Christ? Are you trying to hide from Are you trying to hide from God in your conscience? It's not possible. Do you wrap yourself in excuses? Well, you know what? I'm going to deal with that later on. And put on put on the long finger. Or do you wrap yourself in the perfect righteousness of Christ? Are you clothed in him today? If you do not know him or you are in some doubt, run to him. Feast from the tree of life that is in the midst of the garden, which is the wisdom of God. Turn from your own foolishness to Christ's wisdom and be as the psalmist writes, like as a, pl a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You may run, you may try to hide, but all you will reap is thorns and thistles. Sin has consequences. Are you in Christ or are you, are you in excuses? Are you residing in Adam? For in Adam all die. Are you in Christ? <coughs> he is a willing savior for all those who repent and believe. All those who will flee from the city of destruction and will throw themselves on his infinite mercies. To repent does not mean to morally make yourself and clean yourself up like our first parents. Repent means to surrender and declare, as, as I quoted earlier from Steve Austin, declare bankruptcy. Absolute dependency. That way you're no longer, as our first parents, at this point as we read them, you're no longer spiritually dead. You're no longer judicially dead. Awaiting the final death, the eternal death. But now, because you're being regenerated, because you're residing in Christ, you are spiritually alive and have no longer condemnation to your account because you are in Christ and, and you cannot wait to be with Him in glory. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this wonderful truth you give us in your word. Father, may we not follow the example of our first parents, Adam and Eve. Oh Lord, that we may throw ourselves upon your mercies, realizing, Lord, that all the sin and the suffering of this world, the fault lies with man. O oh Lord, that we would even do the same ourselves. O oh Lord, that the same patterns that we've seen in their response is very similar to our own. Father, 
this night, I pray that there is not anyone here that does not know you, Lord, as Savior. Oh, Lord, that it would not be the words of men that may interest people this night, but the words of God, the words of the living God may excite our consciences, may, may excite us to grow in the knowledge of the truth and to throw ourselves upon the mercy of Christ. May we rest in Him this day, this Lord's day, your day. May you bless each and every one here. Bless all those who could not be here. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our conversation after, the, after this message. May you bless our fellowship together and bless all that we shall receive. In Jesus' name I now pray. Amen. Amen.